the west coast here we've had a snowy day and and it's uh it's sunday which is i know across the world is just uh Sometimes it's Monday somewhere else. Okay, so anyway, um, it's interesting to hear from uh, uh, these, uh, you know, the three talk. Uh, and I can I share my screen with people? I'm not sure how to do that. I know this is a, let me try to do that first. Share my screen. Okay, here we go. There we go. So hopefully you can see my screen. So uh, thank you again for joining uh, the uh, for the uh, cross disciplinary workshops uh, autonomy for future science missions. And we have uh, our chair, uh, who's done a lot of work to thank for the session and um, wanted to show my appreciation. And and the rest of these names are the co um, uh, co conveners of this session. So um, the, the goal of this, uh, as you have seen in the, on the website is, you know, I don't have to reprise this, but I, those are the questions that are really interesting to me were, you know, right here in the three bullets, you know, how ML AI can at enable autonomous uh, uh, space science. And as, as Mike Siebel mentioned, uh, we had a workshop um, in, in two workshops, uh, and the last of which uh, generated a report, which you can find on the internet if you uh, uh, Google it, and I can try and post it at the, uh, in our chat uh, in, a, in a short time, maybe Mike can do it. And however, the, the, the interesting thing that NASA wanted to understand was how we can use autonomy to enable future space science missions. So that is some question that I would definitely want to poke at today. And also, um, uh, you know, the platforms, the technology necessary, as well as as how to deal with you know advanced how to use maybe terrestrial advances towards uh, crude missions as well so uh fyi if you guys um need to submit a question you can um you know after you've seen i'm ho hoping you've seen this you can go to this website uh and enter this uh event code to pose your questions where to your speakers and um and with your questions and then you can upvote questions if you need it um, and mark uh, is going to be providing us with um, uh, the uh, the questions uh, as it comes in okay so those are just kind of uh, the logistics of, of uh, the, the what's going on um, so ha having said that are there any questions oh yes I see some questions um, to Michael Mike, Mike Siebelm, are you on? Um, yeah, okay. So Mike, what advanced new technologies are being considered for autonomous navigation in surface, in, in rover and surface missions? Which is kind of appropriate since we're going to go to Mars in a few days. So um, I don't know any specific technologies that are, are new for uh, rovers. Um, for um, landers, for landing, there is the terrain relative navigation that was introduced on Mars 2020. Uh, so for the first time, the, the spacecraft will actually see the ground uh, where it's going to land um, and will be allowed certain degrees of freedom for making decisions. Um, so in that regard, uh, there are some uh, new technologies. For the rovers, I'm not aware of um, uh, new technologies that have been proposed to date. And so uh, th this is why I think, uh, you know, we develop a lot of these capabilities um, at the lower TRL capabilities are being developed, but we have this huge gap in terms of getting those infused into missions. And this is, this is where I'm, you know, trying to um, uh, focus my efforts. We have to retire the risk of these new technologies so that the missions will be willing to use them. So um, I don't know if that completely answers your question, but I'm not, I'm not aware of any uh, specific uh, rover technologies that are, uh, have, have been proposed for uh, near-term missions. Okay, uh, and, and Mike, we have another question for you. Um, would integration of autonomy 
at NASA be addressed through public pri private partnerships? Would these be national or international? Oh, I think that the public private partnerships are critical. So at the autonomy workshop, we identified uh, three areas. Now I'm going to be challenged to remember the three, but one was public private partnerships. The other was broad agency announcements. And the third, um, uh, and it escapes me, but there were, there were three procurement methods that we felt that we had to pursue public private partnerships, given the fact that most of the technology development is um, occurring in academia and industry. Um, it's absolutely critical that we have more in the way of public private partnerships. Now, our Space Technology Mission Directorate has done a good job of this with um, their tipping point uh, solicitations, um, where there's uh, the tipping point solicitations are, are focused on those technologies which are very close to being commercialized so that, that with additional funding, you can push them over the tipping point and they could be uh, commercialized. And typically, um, the, uh, the company that is the, uh, the, in receipt, the winner of the, of the award, is offering some um, contribution in terms of uh, capabilities or funding as well. So absolutely, that's an area that we are pursuing. Hi. So, um there's another question. Um, so, given the success of uh, DS1 in demonstrating an autonomy, is NASA considering future tech demo missions? Um, <laughs> we, we would hope, you know, it's my desire to see the New Millennium Program be revived and that we have new technology demonstration missions. Um, we, are, we have a technology demonstration mission program in Space Technology Mission Directorate. Um, it's not quite the same as the old New Millennium program where we could test instruments and, and platforms, but it, it does serve um, a, a good purpose. It, it, it has matured technologies. I mentioned in the talk, the Deep Space Optical Com is one technology demonstration that will be flying on our, our Psyche mission. Another was the, um, uh, the, deep, the Deep Space Atomic Clock. The Deep Space Atomic Com is flying on Psyche. Deep Space Atomic Clock is another uh, technology that was flown recently, which we believe we can use on a number of our deep space missions for uh, precision navigation. So I don't want to leave anyone with the impression that there's, there are no technology demonstrations being performed. That's not true. I, I think there are some good ones. Um, it would be nice to have an expansion of, of the program so that we can mature some of the instrument technologies, which I think that's where the real gap is right now. Okay, so um, I'm there are some questions at, uh, on Slido that Mark um, is going to, I guess, uh, copy here. Let's see if we can get those questions. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that Mark, uh, you can copy it and put it in the, in the message uh, chat here okay, I'll to me. Thank you. Um, while, while Mark's doing that, I, I have a question uh, of my own. So, um, the Cassini mission uh, was, was really grandly successful. It, it, it's, it's a mission that's dear and near to my heart because it's the first NASA mission I worked on as a young engineer cutting my teeth. And I was responsible for you know, the hardware and software for the INMS instrument the Cassini, on the Cassini instrument, uh, uh, spacecraft, as well as the one on the probe. But what's interesting to me is that the Cassini spacecraft spent um, 13 years studying the moons, you know, working the orbits really carefully and, and, and um, when it, was, when it was slated to run out of fuel, uh, the scientists behind the, the trajectory maneuvers decided to go in, go deep, go bold, like the way Mike said it, right? They went in with a daring trajectory that would send the spacecraft into uh, 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 looping through the, the moons of Saturn before burning up in its atmosphere so that we do not, uh, the, the reason to destroy the spacecraft 
is so that we ensure that we do not uh, contaminate the potentially habitable wounds in the system. Like we won't catch any earth, uh, earth germs, right? So, um, so during the final uh, uh, moments uh, where Cassini was making ever deeper measurements of the plasma density, the magnetic field, the, the temperatures, the atmospheric composition, we, we um, found lots and lots of important measurements uh, that, that Cassini as a large strategic mission uh, or flagship mission uh, did. Um, you know, and, and the question I have is then to, to the, the panel, I don't, you know, I, you know all, all of you, uh, here is what if you know we we ha you know in for these flagship missions right that we would have um, like say the next Europa lander will have autonomy right how how can we um, get these important discoveries that 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 Cassini made the the new radiation belt that was discovered the connection between the inner rings and the upper atmosphere where they had electric currents uh, discovered and measured and and the organics that that flowed from the inner ring to the upper you know down to the upper atmosphere and all these other measurements of the magnetic field. we found a lot of stuff in the time where we became you know we, we were bold you know would we be bolder if we had autonomy um what about small spacecraft so i'm going to stop talking i'm kind of throwing out the question there because small spacecraft to me you know i i hold a, a different position within uh, nasa that talks about small, that deals with small spacecraft. So I'm very interested in, in how the crowds, uh, I guess, uh, the crowds, uh, you know, wisdom can, can talk about this. So uh, anyone, you know, Mike, uh, Valentina, you know, the, the folks uh, who are in the uh, panel, uh, you know, Sala and, and, and Mark, you know, all, all of you, right? How, what do you guys think? And I think Lorraine's there too. Yeah, it would be interesting to get Lorraine's take on this. Well, I, yeah, I certainly, here, I'll turn my video on even though I didn't dress for the occasion. Um, you look fine. <laughs> In my sweats, yes. <laughs> I, mean, I, I love the uh, the combination of the small sets and autonomy because I feel like on so many of our flagship missions we we don't want to risk losing the asset to some new technologies and so we're very reticent to try new things um, you know even if they've been demonstrated somewhere else we we still take a very conservative approach but if we can shift our mindset into something like, um, you know, let's throw a hundred small sets out there and, and go to different places and try different, um, different autonomy capabilities. Maybe they each have a, you know, they, they don't all have the same thing on them. Maybe they each have different ones and we see which ones work. You know, it, it, it opens up the space for us to be able to, um, Dare mighty things, if I can say that, as JPL's motto, to to try out new 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 autonomy take capabilities um, without being shackled by the the low risk um, position that that we seem to need on these these big Cassini like missions. Um, and and then there's also the fact that for for Cassini, I was I was quite impressed that with Cassini we were able to predict ahead of time the the orbits and and the crews through through the system through the through the uh, um, the jo the Saturn system and I don't know that that can always be done let's say we wanted to go at a low altitude around a small body we that's not as predictable ahead of time and so there are certain things that are pulling us to put more capabilities on board, if we really want to get onto into a low orbit around a, a small body that we don't really know, it's you know don't have a good gravitational model. You know, we need a spacecraft that can sense that and react to it. And so, I think I think small sat small satellites really are an enabler to help us start to fly more autonomy um, without having to risk a flagship mission. 
Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think that's our biggest hope is the, the cheap small satellites. So if we lose the cheap small satellites, it's not plastered all over the front page of the Washington Post. NASA uh, just blew $2 billion on a mission that they recklessly put autonomy, you know, and, um, and it, you know, they didn't have to do it or whatever. It, it would not be good press. But if, if you lose um, a few small sats um, that, that's, you know, orders of magnitude less in cost, I think that is our biggest hope. And, and Florence, of course, is involved in the small satellite uh, program at, at headquarters. And so that I think is, is one, one area where we can, we can get, um, we can make some progress. It is frustrating though, um, you know, you think about Voyager, um, everything about that mission when it launched was new. There was, no, there was nothing about it that had flown before or, or uh, you know, but we, we did it. And I'm not sure that we would ever do a mission like that again. And it's, it is a little bit, it is a little frustrating. So um, what changed between then and now? Do you think? I, I don't know. That's you a know. very good question. Um, that's a very I, good question. I have a, I have some, if you're going to ask about that, I, I traced the, uh, the, the lack of appetite for risk uh, around the 2000s, you know, late 2000s uh, era, because there was an, a, a sh space shuttle accident and we had, um, you know, a, a look of how we were building hardware. Certainly that certainly contributed to it, I, I think, you know. Um, so I, I also wanted to address the, a question that I got earlier and I wasn't really prepared to answer. I think I've, uh, somebody asked about rover capabilities. Um, we are now testing new autonomous rover capabilities on the moon. So there is a project called um, uh, it was it was called uh, Puffer, and then it it um, it evolved yeah. to a new name. Uh, cadre. cadre. Yeah, Cadre. Yeah. yeah. So so Cadre is testing autonomous capabilities on the moon. So the moon, given the fact that we've got this new lunar um, initiative, um, we do have an opportunity to to test some new capabilities on the moon, and to a certain extent they can be extrapolated to icy moons. Uh, although obviously the surface of, of our moon is very different from the surface of Europa. Um, there are still a number of technologies that we can demonstrate. So hopefully through this new lunar initiative, we can do some low cost testing. A lot of it can be tested on the ground too. I mean, a, a lot of the rover technologies, you don't have to even go into space, but if you really want a, a, a test of the, the radiation environment, the thermal environment, all of that. Um, I think that we do have a new capability now. These are low cost um, uh, rovers. Uh, also uh, Astrobotic in Pittsburgh, they have their own uh, platforms uh, that they'll be testing. Small uh, rovers that can crawl along the surface. So hopefully we can retire some risk uh, with autonomous systems uh, through those missions. So I so I actually posted uh, one of the Slido questions and that was um, directed at Mike, but anybody here, please comment. I wanted to know how the, the decrease in the launch costs, uh, or if they have an appreciable impact on the risk posture for missions. Florence, you want to tackle that one? Sure. I, uh... So I am the, so for those who do not know, I am the uh, chair of the small spacecraft uh, coordination group uh, for, for NASA. And, um, and uh, I, I think the risk posture is being debated right now in the sense that internally within uh, NASA, we have, uh, we understand that, that if, uh, for small sets particularly, if the the, the, the cost is lower, we are able to make more missions, uh, you know, more quickly, more affordably, do more science, make more measurements with greater diversity of people, results, and then sustain this long term, right? The, the whole point is sustainable observations. And, and we have been in some ways hampered by the big observations, observa you know, observatories, because 
because you have to spend this big amount of money and you make the small number of, of, of measurements that you want. So, so there'll be the way uh, we, I look at it is that, yes, the, the cost will definitely uh, change the way we, we think about uh, missions, I, I believe. And, and, but even so, right, the, 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 there's a sea change in the way the perhaps missions will be executed in future, especially for those that are closer to the earth where, where you have a higher replenishment rate. So, so say you fly a large constellation, perhaps you do not have to have this mission with a X probability of success. You know, you, you, you can say, okay, I, not, I, I want to have it uh, last uh, for this one spacecraft, three years versus 12 years, right? There's a difference. So, so uh, and the scientific community is also is interested in um, uh, want, not, not like spending their career to get one mission, right? They, they, they want to get uh, these, these missions that can provide greater coverage and resiliency and redundancy to make the measurements that they need. So, so the benefits of a lower cost spacecraft, maybe to speed things up perhaps, and to also think about how we as, uh, uh, we think about the, the risk reliability posture you know make by all those all those things come into play and 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 perhaps then to be able to have a greater diversity of knowledge um and so the risk posture is is tight with the cost is tight with with you know the the platform that we use does that help so um uh, thanks uh, florence uh, i just want to make sure that we go through uh cover all the questions that are yes asked i was gonna ask <laughs> so uh, to Valentina specifically, can these methods work uh, for Earth observation data sets? Uh, example, hyperspectral uh, uh, observations. You know, we have petabytes of data. I'm going to talk about Earth data. That's yeah. I have actually a corollary, corollary to that in that because it's such a diverse set of data. How do you deal with calibration? Thank you. Um, thanks. I think in general, uh, yes. Uh, I know there are many applications of deep learning to Earth observation images, and then also for uh, trying to synthetically reproduce some channels. Um, I think there are a lot of similarities. Um, in case you do expect some relations between the different the different channels, and I think you do expect that in many cases also in Earth observation you could try something very similar uh, because a deep learning model should be able to uh, learn which are the patterns between the channels that should enable you to compress some of, of the signal. So I think it, that would be a very interesting experiment. We haven't tried to a different, with a different kind of data, but yeah, in principle, I think it's possible. We do have a cultural barrier that the, our scientists typically do not like lossy compressed data uh, yeah i know but it, it i think it depends what you what is the science purpose and if you can demonstrate that you can reach the same science purpose uh i think we can apply that um in our specific case i think uh, you have to demonstrate what is the gain uh so if you can demonstrate that compressing some of the signal is the only way you can actually send something back to Earth, uh, I think it would be much easier to convince also scientists that's a possible route. Uh, for Earth observation, it's different because like we are much closer, so obviously you can downlink at higher rate, but it's also true that you go into the petabytes uh, instead of tera. So I think, uh, there is something that probably you can gain also there, especially in terms of speed, uh, depending on what is the application that you're trying to solve with your Earth observation data, you might be interested. I, um, I would like to add that Solar Orbiter, which is an ESA NASA mission that already um, has a an FPGA on board to take uh, polarization measurements at different spectral positions and then uh, do a radiative transfer, an iterative inversion to calculate what the magnetic field is on the sun. 
and then only beam back the inversion. So, so that, that in a sense is an irreversible uh, compression, but they deemed that it was necessary in order to get enough data because the telemetry was so, so low um, for, for such a deep space mission. Um, yeah, so I, I think it depends on really the, the science requirements. And, and I agree with Florence that um, knowing exactly the calibration and how the instruments or the different observatories work when applying the ML uh, techniques is absolutely critical. But, but that's critical even if you're not doing anything ML. You're just supposed to understand the data. And, and so in the big uh, companies these days, you don't only have data scientists or machine learning engineers, you have data engineers, you have uh, DevOps people, you have people working on the stack and, and they all need to communicate with each other. So I think that that clearly needs to happen. Uh, that's my take. So um, before I forget, I, I also want to make sure that um, that if you have any questions that you want to ask verbally uh, in this group, because it's a small group, please raise your hands and, you know, we can turn on your mic. Uh, so that's, you know, it does, you don't have to type it uh, here. And it's really exciting to hear all this discussion. Um, and also uh, to, to Mike Seabloom, uh, there, no, I don't know if it's Mike, but it's this, um, there's, there's a comment from, uh, to everyone from, from John Day. I don't believe that taking big steps towards requires big risks. It takes commitment to do the whole job. And that's why Voyager worked. Um, agreed. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's <laughs> or I, not. I, yeah, I completely agree. Um, I, I just worry that our risk, uh, we don't, we're not even complaining about big risks, we're complaining about little risks these days. So the, the, this isn't really true, but the, the, a lot of our PIs would say, we've heard them say this, that in order to fly a new technology, it has to have already flown. Um, so that's not even taking big risks, that's taking almost no risk at all. So we have to get, we have to get out of that mindset. Um, I agree. I mean, it, we shouldn't be taking big unnecessary risks, but um, we should be taking some. I mean, we should, we should be able to be willing to fly new technologies that have not flown before. Um, and we have to have a means for validating them um, so that, you know, they'll be accepted. So, so I, I, I meant to, you know, so, sorry, when I was reading the question, I was reading too fast, uh, fast about the uh, decrease in launch costs just now. I, I, I was rolling when to answer the question whether uh, the, whether there was, if you decrease, you know, the cost of the launches decrease, whether there was an appreciable impact on NASA's uh, autonomy uh, risk posture, right? So, so, and I tried to say that, you know, in my, my answering the question, I kind of jumped over the fact that, you know, the, the, um, the, you know, I didn't mention autonomy, but it is implied that if we want to test any technology, uh, including autonomy, um, it helps that the cost is lower because if you, if you, doesn't if it doesn't do so well you're you're not at risk uh, like like mike said you know it doesn't show up in the washington post as you know nasa lost another spacecraft so that's that's the thing that uh is is very clear that that risk and cost uh has a link i'd be interested if isa has these problems do we have any isa members who would ESA, like to speak up an isa person we had a very good ESA talk. Unfortunately, Pierre Philippe uh, couldn't make it to the Q and A, um, partly because of the time zone. It's uh, it's unreasonable to expect our European colleagues to necessarily dial in. Um, but we can ask ask him afterwards, and then and then get back to to all of us. And what about Australians? Right, I think uh, Salah is. Uh, I, I don't know if you're Australian, but uh, you know, I, I'm interested in you know the 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 folks around this table this virtual table um uh this is more on the question i think there's a couple of things here we've got to keep in mind that space agency in australia has only recently started so there isn't much in terms of we can talk about and 
uh, in terms of risk of launches or anything like that. Um, autonomy in general, though, uh, for those around the table, probably Australia leads the world when it comes to automation in general industry applications. So mining, stevedoring, uh, aviation, there's lots of autonomous systems that have been running around now, large systems. Uh, risk, uh, yeah, I mean, risk is a, a process where that both the technology of evolution decreases risk. Um, so that's one, one element of it also. As technology moves on, the risk drops um, in that specific area. Um, but then the application of that in a particular area requires, um, uh, in our case, uh, when it comes to non-space matters, um, safety being a big thing, um, uh, especially when you're dealing with mixed man, unmanned operations where you, where you have that. Um, and so you have to be able to work, work that through. So um, it's not an answer I can answer directly because we don't really have any space specific launch missions yet. Um, and, and the only example that I can give is with regards to the non-space or civilian applications that we have. You know, you're in an enviable position because you're starting from scratch. You're starting fresh and you can, you can look at all of these lessons learned and you can uh, perhaps correct some of these, these problems. So the first motto should be, we, we don't believe in risk or something. So let's just go for it. So, so actually, you have a point there, right, um, uh, Mike, and also uh, Sal. You know, like, so, so we all want to see autonomy adopted, so that you know, not because we want, uh, you know, because we have a hammer, everything's a nail. It's more like we know how much autonomy can do for missions. The the issue is how to convince scientists to adopt the autonomy for their missions. How how to convince NASA, as John put it, John Daly. He had said, well, you know, it just takes commitment. Well, you know, uh, how do we prepare uh, our missions to get to that, that commitment or the, our leaders? And how do we push our technologies to, to these missions to enable uh, the, 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 actually to get more science? I mean, that's the, the point of this. So how do we do that? Right, you guys are following us here, I, and you had a doppelganger there for a little while. Um, I don't know if, uh, if Terry, if you have any, Terry is the NASA lead for autonomous systems. I'm just curious if you have any, any thoughts. Terry, are you at your desk? Or it might be muted. Terry's muted. Yeah. We may not. We may not actually have Terry. It was. It was kind of weird. There were two Terrys for a while. Uh, so I think um, Terry shared his uh, uh, dialing credentials with the panelists of the of the rover uh, panel discussion, and so that's why we had uh, two Terrys for a while. Um, oh, I see. And maybe he'll he'll be. He'll be back, and I think um, definitely during the panel discussion, we can raise this question again. Is the issue here for scientists that there are not enough missions? I mean, it's all eggs in one basket, so they want to make sure that everything's done right. And because, you know, it, it, it matters so much, right? it's one chance of collecting data and, and, and the sensors that we deploy or whatever it might be, and, and that's it. We never know whether the space agency is going to launch again in the future. So, I mean, that's that's a huge risk for a scientist, I guess, especially down their academic career path. So I assume that as launches become more frequent and easier, or the, the technology around launches decreases, then, you know, you start to get more opportunities and, and maybe the risk profile changes from there. Um, Mike? Mike was going to say something? I just said I agree. I agree with that. Um, I think and, uh, I agreed. I agree because it's it's a uh, it's a uh, you know, and that that's where the small set has such great promise because we could try these things in little bite size bite bite sized chunks instead of giant you know billion dollar missions. You know, that's that's the hope we have um, to be able to 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 use these very interesting platforms one small. Uh, small set at a time. Although I think it's going towards ASPA class to, for the more capable spacecraft. So I think Andy Mesh wanted to say something. 
Yes, I have a question. Uh, so by the way, let me introduce myself. I'm Animesh Gurg, I'm a faculty at the University of Toronto, and I work on uh, robot learning, primarily deep reinforcement learning for uh, robot manipulation and control. One very interesting question, because I'm relatively new to this line of research is, how do you reconcile the speed of progress and research in that say AI deep reinforcement learning, which moves at a much faster pace compared to uh, projects and commitments in uh, missions because uh, a mission that was scheduled with a certain technology that was TRL level X in 2015 may not be re relevant anymore even though what is still in flight in the sense of de development. Florence, you should talk about Cassini. Yeah, so Cassidy, let me say something about Cassidy because it's so, you know, this is where you get lessons learned, right? We, I think the decadal uh, study says, oh, we got to go to Saturn. And it was like 10 years before, you know, they, they mentioned it 10 years before. And then finally it got approved and we launched uh, about like 1997, right? I started working on it in 1991. It launched in 97. It arrived in 2005. By the time you arrive, the, the hardware is is old technology, essentially, right? I, I remember asking to use FPGAs uh, to launch, and they said, oh, this is too risky. And this was in 1995. You know, it's, it's like, oh, 94, you can't use FPGAs, right? The A1020, uh, 10, 1012, 1020s, yeah. That was the very first generation of, of uh, FPGAs. But the, the fact is, yeah, NASA, you know, we, we will have to fly these tech demos in order to use the newest technologies. And we have, right? The Mars helicopter, okay, it may not be the newest, you know, Snapdragon chips, but we, at least we're trying to, to get those, um, those, the pieces of hardware into space. Uh, and, and hard, you know, you don't want to also, of course, like, uh, like Sala says, put all your eggs in one basket and have something fail because one thing didn't work. So there's this, there's this balance between risk and, and uh, you know, just go, do, go use the hardware that you need. Now, we also set, have, having said all that, we also have uh, innovations that we uh, make in order to, uh, to uh, have these uh, sensors that we need. So for example, um, I think, uh, uh, Pre-fire, a uh, small spacecraft that's launching, you know, I don't know, maybe 22, it, it is a uh, polar orbiting um, uh, infrared uh, uh, sense, uh, uh, satellites. These are small spacecraft. And we invested in, uh, you know, uh, room temperature, um, the detectors and, and you know, these uh, optics that allowed us to, to do that. So sometimes you can't even buy the stuff. So there's this mix of technologies that we, we use. So I, I, I uh, sometimes understand why uh, NASA needs to do that because it takes seven years to get there. You don't want to get there and fail. So we have to balance that against uh, just trying the very newest technology because there's no recall, right? And, and you know, if you, ha if you have hardware that doesn't work like your, your widget or whatever it is, you can, you can make a new iteration. The iteration that is, that's promising, again, I, I hate to come back to small spacecraft, is we can fly, learn uh, about it, and then refly. So that's the, the approach that we should be taking uh, with these kinds of platforms. Try it you know, close to the Earth before we send it out. Now, planetary stuff, you know, where, where we need autonomy, it's going to be a harder, harder uh, case to make uh, for uh, the technology that we'll have to demonstrate. And that includes autonomy. So if I could, Anamesh, let me give you an example. I, I think you, you bring up a very important point. Uh, Europa Lander, we were having some discussions about Europa Lander a few years ago. And I, I remember going down to the planetary science division. It was, it was a early, you know, one of these late evening, uh, I was there real late and they were there working and they had their consultants there talking about the lander mission. And, um, and it, again, this is a mission that'll occur in the next decade. And um, you know, I asked specifically about autonomy and they said, well, we're trying to plan for as little as possible. Um, and we wanna just use today's technology. That way they don't have to worry about um, you know, technology forecasting. 
well, I kind of had a fit because, you know, I, I don't, and one reason we had the autonomy workshop in 2018 was to get the scientists and the technologists together so that they'll understand this is a rapidly evolving field. You're going to be designing these missions. You're going to be thinking about these missions today. Your proposal is not going to come in for, you know, seven more years. Don't plan for what we have today. Plan for what we'll probably have in seven years. And, and so that was one of the main goals of the workshop was to get them thinking in the future. And we had to have the autonomy experts. We went to, uh, we had the workshop at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and, and the goal was to, to kind of open their eyes to say, all right, you can dream a little bit bigger. And, um, you know, if worse comes to worse, if seven years comes and the technology is not mature, you haven't lost anything. You can always fail back to your original plans. Um, but that's the best we can do. Then it, it's always going to be obsolete by the time it, it reaches its destination. Um, there's, there's a five-year period where the technology has to be finished and then the mission uh, has to launch. Uh, so you lose that. And then like Florence said, it's got to fly to the destination and that could be years. Um, so, um, you know, that's, but, but we're not doing the best we can do it at the moment. Um, and that's what we're trying to do is let's do the best we can do in terms of not being so completely obsolete. So I see there's a question. Um, yeah, the uh, TRL six, TRL six, not seven. It has to be at TRL six at PDR. So on that chart that I showed in my talk, that if you notice the missions that were from 2021 to 2024, they were all grayed out. That's because the technology programs can't help them. It's too late. They have to be at TRL six by by PDR, five years before launch. So we have another question uh, to, to uh, Salah. How, how can the general public individuals directly contribute to research and development of autonomous systems? For example, in terms of money, testing, distributed computing, like folding at home, or organizing public events to spread knowledge. This is like citizen science, I suppose. Um, so we, we've done, okay, again, again, outside of space, there's been a lot of work in marine as well as in agriculture where large data sets have been used and, and shared to the public where through citizen science, they do things like labeling and, and helping with the machine learning systems that go through that. Um, that's probably the, uh, the limit that it's, it's, it's gone. And I think there's been a lot of that activity happening also within the space sector, um, where, where, um, where the public has access to the data and is used to help support that that process. Um, and there's been lots of talks over the years. I mean, I remember once uh, about, you know, desktop computers and laptops that are just sitting there idling on screensaver mode and how they can be used in a distributed network to help with processing and, and capabilities. I don't know if it's, uh, I don't believe it's it's gone uh, beyond that. Um, but that, that's been our, that's been our, the extent of our work here in, in our lab and, and, and from what I know um, in Australia in general um, around those areas in marine and in, in agriculture. As for the other way around in terms of, I think the question was part of that in terms of communication. Um, outside of space, I don't know if robotics has really had, I mean, drones have had a, a big impact, but there probably could be more of the the, the public agenda, you know, from the, from the research science side of, out to the public. Uh, generally, it's a bit more negative, right? Just robots are taking over the world or whatever it might be um, when it comes to non-space uh, activities. But, but I think there could be more of that um, um, in terms of comms. Okay, thank you very much. Um, to all the panelists, what measures are being taken for international collaboration for advancement of autonomy, in autonomy, sorry. Mike, do you want to talk about it? Well, I guess the, the problem we have, it's difficult to partner on technology development because of ITAR uh, issues. Um, 
uh, we can collaborate on things like, um, you know, if you develop this part, we'll do this part. So that, that's how the, the collaboration has to occur. We can't, it's difficult, not impossible, it's difficult to share, um, uh, you know, breakthrough, like quantum, we're, we're looking at quantum sensors right now, quantum communication, um, things involving entanglement or superposition. It would be difficult for us to partner with um, a non-US uh, entity, um, uh, which is unfortunate because uh, there's a lot going on um, in other parts of the world um, that we could benefit from. Um, so I, I wish I had a better answer, but there's, it, we don't do a lot of technology development with international partners yet. And, and Mike, to, uh, so I'd be interested to hear what, what some of the other, the Australians or the Europeans are doing. I, I did attend a meeting uh, between the Australian Space, Space Agency and uh, arranged by our International Affairs Office uh, about the very, very um, topic that Salah mentioned, which was uh, how that you do autonomy uh, to do your mining operations. And I believe that that was something that was being discussed. I don't know it, what happened to that, talk, uh, that, that meeting and I wasn't, I have to, I have to go back and figure out, uh, you know, if there's any development in that area. There have been two forms of, I mean, so, so you're both right. I think that um, in the past we've, you know, we have a lot, we have a large robotics activity here and, and some good demonstrations, but had limited access to partner with, we say NASA or ESA because of because of that um, um, that requirement. Uh, it hasn't prevented activity from coming together. I mean, students have been exchanged. Uh, I've had students work with Terry, for example, in their labs, and you know, ideas get exchanged in different forms. Um, we've been able to build rovers here, and and you know, do have some research fun uh, around that. So at least there's been this opportunity, like it is now, to be able to kind of. Um, Get around the table and talk about the problems even though there may not be any formal partnership but i think it's that it comes down to the space agencies and um, talking to each other and kind of working collaborating so those workshops that you mentioned florence have happened we've had similar ones with ESA because of the the development of the space agency and and the hope is that there can be some form of collaboration on different levels I mean, maybe there are aspects there that where, where there are where their collaboration can happen So um, we're coming close to the end of the hour. I was wondering if there's anyone else with uh, questions uh, about this. I, I did ask, uh, I'm not sure if I got an answer in terms of, you know, uh, this, to the scientists out there, you know, how do, it, it seems to me that this kind of technology is, is new and that risk reward appetite has to be calibrated, just finely calibrated. Um, and, um, and the, the, I had a final question uh, for, uh, I guess, uh, maybe uh, rest of the, the audience, right? Um, where do we see in, where do we see in say 10 years, right? I, I, I like to have people predict this, you know, is it still more of the same? Are we gonna actually get to the point where maybe the self-driving cars of today, uh, and it's very different, right? We don't have knowledge of, we, we don't go around mapping every rock on the moon or, or Mars or Europa because we can't, we don't have that. So what happens, you know, what's the future? So, so tell me your thoughts on, on the future. I mean, Salah, you're on, the, I can see your face. So perhaps you want to start Just predict. It's okay. There's no wrong answer. Sorry, if there's no wrong answer, so we can say whatever we want. Can we, um, that's, it's, uh, I mean, if I went, if we go back 20 years ago, when we built, you know, a, a platform that was 60 tons and, and had to move around on concrete floors and, and carry containers around, that took uh, close to 15 engineers, six years. Most of the cost was on technology. Uh, the salary costs were minimal. Uh, come 20 years later, it's all flipped, right? Technology now is ubiquitous and it's much easier now for people around the world to be able to build. And I think that's, if you start to, project that forward, everything from whether it's uh, easier within labs, um, you know, even in universities, now we start to ask questions about whether we should be doing more autonomous cars given 
what's going on out there in the industry, you know, which are doing, uh, you know, advancing a lot quicker, um, startups. Um, and, and so where does the research and development work uh, fit? But technology cost and technology ubiquitous is going to be there. Um, it's going to make it easier to, to, I think, build and launch that type of technology. Um, and I think that will change the landscape. Um, what does that look like? I mean, it's, um, as we know in robotics, it's, 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 it's complexity and, and, um, uh, and, and reducing that. Uh, my, my f one of the areas of research that I think will be, will, will be advancing and we'll learn a lot more from is the relationship between the human and the machine and how knowledge is shared and decisions are made when you have autonomous systems working with experts and the, the different levels of information and knowledge and how they get shared and fused in real time. So machine learning on a bot, learning within the human in the operation and how do they get shared and used as part of decisions in real time. And I think that will, you know, the, the whole concept of cobots and what that means is going to be important and, and probably will change the way operations run very quickly uh, uh, in, in the near future. Uh, so thanks everyone. Uh, this was a great discussion. Uh, we are scheduled uh, in two minutes to have the panel discussion. Uh, so I, I see there are some questions posted still in the Q&A. Uh, there's one more, but maybe we can get back to Cedric later. And, and I hope uh, many of us stick around for more discussions. Uh, so let me suggest that we take a, a uh, five minute break and come back. Uh, meanwhile, Terry and